I'm Norm Silverstein, and I'm glad you're with us today because we're in very good company with Garth Fagan. I hardly have to say more than that, and you probably have an image of Garth Fagan or a Garth Fagan dance in your mind. Garth is well known, not just in our community, but around the world. His dance company is famous for its signature movements. They've been called powerful, fluid, off balance, energetic, out of sync, and brilliant. He's the winner of a Tony Award, an Olivier Award, an Eastman Medal, just to name a few. Garth Fagan began his world-class company right here in Rochester, and today we're so happy you can be with us. Welcome. Glad to be here, Norm. Glad to be here. Well, Garth, you're really associated with Rochester so, so closely, but you were born and raised in Jamaica. What was it like growing up there, and how did you get interested in dance? Growing up in Jamaica was heaven. I was from a well-off family, so we had maids and servants and yard boys to do everything. I had one problem, and it was my dad. When I was a kid, I loved him to pieces, but once I became a teenager, he started to get very difficult with me, and I couldn't play, I couldn't go do anything. And I said, Dad, I wanna go to Norm's party. Well, you haven't done your homework. Well, you haven't done whatever chore. As chief education officer and principals of the high schools and whatever, he had to set a standard. And his son, I was under the microscope all the time. And he used to tell me, Garth, discipline is freedom. Garth, discipline is freedom. I heard that three times a day and twice after meals. And it meant that I had to go back to study. Even football practice, what you guys call soccer, discipline. That was okay with him, but he had to know when it started and when it stopped, and I best be home when it stopped. And that's something that you've uh, taken with you with your dance company. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. In, a, in my, one of my opening numbers, Prelude, the subtitle is Discipline is Freedom, because dancers have to take classes twice a day and stretch before every performance and really keep the human body, which is the instrument, in top shape. So in 1973, I was possessed in taking the dance company to Jamaica, and I didn't know why. So we didn't have any money then, but I used my dad's American Express card and charged flights for 16 dancers and um, hotel to go down there. And then I got there and I called him up and I said, Dad, I'm here with my dance company. I'm not staying at home. We open tomorrow night. I have a box reserved for you because a man of his prestige needed a box. Um, give me a call to make sure you're come. you'll come. So then he came, and he came with seven friends and relatives and came backstage after the show. Oh, what a wonderful show. If he had told me it was going to have intellectual content and creative stamina, I never would have fought you so hard. And my dancers are saying, this is the man you said was so tough on you. What a lovely man. But the next year, he died from a stroke. Mm -hmm. And he never would have seen the company if I hadn't carried them home then. And I would have been wondering to this day of my life, was this good enough for daddy? Was this good enough for daddy? And thank God I did that. Well, there were a few stops between growing up in Jamaica and getting here to Rochester. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your work in Detroit and a few other places before you came here? And, I, and I'd like to know a little bit more about what your original plans were, too, and we'll get to that. I went to an Ivy League school, which was Dad's preference, being an Oxford man, and I went one semester and I said, oh, no, this is not for me. My mom, whom I didn't mention in the beginning, she was excellent, supportive, great cooking, nourishing mother. I lived with her in, in, in Detroit after they had split up. And food, 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 all the dancers there would come over for lunch and that she threw for them, unbeknownst to me, you know. And um, Wayne said I had a beautiful teacher, Pat Welling, who saw something in me and pushed me real hard. And Pat, um, helped me choreograph my first dance um, as a joint choreographic piece. And it was a piece called Contemplations. 
And I was so young and vulgar that I did little speedos to show off the body and the muscles, you know. No music, no music in silence, which this was about 65, 64, 65, was a big scandal, you know. And it went wild, and they applauded all the way through it, and I got my first great review, you know. And it, it came from a place of great um, vulgarity, <laughs> you know, no place artistic. But I since then learned my lesson, thanks to Pat Welling. She taught me a lot of things and nourished me. Then we had Dance Theater of Detroit and Detroit Contemporary Dance Company. And I was principal dancer and choreographer for both. And I was bitten by Martha Graham fabulously then. And Martha was also a great teacher of mine and had me go across the floor 13 times um, to do a simple unadorned walk. And we didn't know anything about Simple on the Door and Walk in that age because we wanted the world to know we were dancers. And I said, whatever this woman wants, and she didn't show us, I'm going to do it. And Irene Rains fell out from me around the 11th time. It was me alone. And then when I finally got it, she said, you're going to go places. And I said, well, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> but what took so long? But it was a lesson that went deep inside of me. Simplify, simplify. Because we were so decorative in our dancing back then, you know. Everything had a little flourish to it and a little flutiloo. And, well, you no. studied with Martha Graham and mm -hmm. Alvin Ailey. Alvin Ailey. Alvin gave me money to start the company because he understood where I was going. Because he said, Garth, with all these trained dancers around, why do you want to start with untrained dancers? I said, because I didn't want to have to waste the time to untrain them from what they had learned, the group fingers and what have you. And I wanted some of that basketball stuff on my stage. Now, putting this original group together, you took some criticism, didn't you? Didn't, didn't oh, people say look. you were taking the bottom of the bucket and you turned that into a phrase? Yeah, it was the bottom of the bucket and I did but, B-U-T, exclamation, 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 because we were using untrained dancers and going from the bottom, but watch where we're going to go. And we went to Buffalo. We did our first show November 15th in Buffalo, 1970, and we took the show. All the critics went crazy, you know. And then we came back to Rochester to work on the company. And Steve Humphrey, who was one of my original dancers, is still dancing with me. And he's 62 years old, and he looks like he's 45, abs and everything. Amazing. So you have several dancers who have been with you a long time, and as you say, past the age that, say, athletes, professional athletes right. would perform, working just as hard and still in the company? Because lots of dance companies think that after you're 30, it's over. And I love the youngsters in the company, and we need them because they're young and they're wild and they can jump and they can turn. Lots of energy, great. But there's something you learn. Steve has been, is now in his second marriage, a happy, beautiful marriage. You know, when you've been divorced, when you've had children, there are things you learn, you accumulate, you know, which great singers and actors share that with us. But dance, because it's so physical, they don't want to use that. And I said, hell no, I want to see a community on stage dancing, people, human beings dancing, as opposed to dancers portraying human beings. And it's a very subtle distinction, but it works for me. We won five Bessie Awards. Um, Steve, Natalie Rogers, Norwood Pennywell, who is now my assistant and a choreographer, mm -hmm. you know, and he's up there in his 50s, you know. So you bring knowledge to the art form, not just, you know, youth. And we have the youth. Don't get me wrong, I love the youth. But Steve can do a simple gesture that speaks volumes, whereas a young dancer can't get it together because they don't understand that kind of simplicity. And what about Garth Fagan? Did an injury take you out of your original dream to be the dancer and made you the founder and 
the patron, really, of this yes, company? Yes, because, frankly, I was going to stop in Rochester and go on to Alvin Ailey, but I had a back injury, and I had dinner with Alvin, and, and Alvin said, Garth, what you're talking about doing, how you see movement, how you see music, is something that's not on any stage, any place. So in the early 70s, you found the company, mm -hmm. and then choreography starts. Hundreds choreography bit me hard, <clears throat> and I loved it. And um, then I could demonstrate to them what I'm doing. Now that for some mysterious reason, my waist has gotten a little bigger. They're not making clothes like they used to. <laughs> Um, so I have Nord Pennywell and Natalie Rogers to demonstrate for me. And they were my assistants when I did The Lion King in 1996, 97, you know. Um, and they're bright too, they're incandescently bright. No, I love bright dancers. And this old fashioned notion of shut up and dance, that's old news. Dancers today are bright because they have to know the moves, they have to know the music, they have to know the space, and they have to know different timings, and which lady is coming flying out of the wings, and you better catch her, you know. So, I mean, um, I don't pay any attention to that. And I've taught all over the world. I mean, all in every continent except Antarctica. So I've seen, all, and audition dancers for Lion King all over the world, you know. So I've seen a wide array of dancers. Well, a lot of people, of course, know your association with Lion King and the awards you've won, but I'm curious, how does Garth Fagan get together with Walt Disney? Well, that was a surprise to me. <laughs> My assistant, Bit Knight, called and said, Walt Disney is looking for me. They want me to choreograph something for them. And my generation, Walt Disney was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and Sleeping Beauty. And I couldn't see anything. And I'd just done this serious duet where both male and female were topless in Griot, New York, with Wynton Marsalis. That when we did it in Paris, we had to stop the show because they wouldn't stop applauding. <clears throat> when we did it in Vienna, they said we got applause reserved only for Grand Opera, you know. So it was, it, it really is a beautiful piece if I say so <laughs> myself. But um, <clears throat> that was what my big thing was. And I'm saying, what am I going to do with Disney? And then she said, well, it's for something called the Lion King. When somebody told me that I was one of three people from around the world, so I called Janet Lomax, and I said, Janet, she had young kids, they had Lion King. I said, loan me your Lion King, because I hadn't seen it. So she loaned me her, and I saw it, and I fell madly in love. And I said, yeah, I can really do this, because I know the culture. I'd been to Africa seven times when I did Lion King, so I knew what was there, and I knew what these animals looked like out in the wild, you know. <clears throat> and I knew what it was like sitting in a little pool in Victoria Falls and the falls and death and damnation right over there. But it's that kind of energy that Africa is full of. So um, next thing I heard, Julie Tamer had me over to her home, showed me her sketches, and they offered me the job. And I said, call my lawyer, and they figured it out. And uh, it's one of the most rewarding experiences I've had, not just for the dancers in America, but in Tokyo, in Hamburg, <laughs> you know, in, in um, Australia, <laughs> you know, in uh, Rio, all over we, we've done Lion King. So I'm meeting a lot of different languages and cultures. And um, I told the then head of Disney, who was a wonderful man and a big supporter of the project, I said, see, they're all speaking in different languages, they're singing in different languages, but they're all dancing in Fagan. <laughs> he just howled, absolutely howled, and passed the story on. Well, your style obviously includes um, African influence and Caribbean, but mm. you've been quoted as saying that uh, you're more interested in uh, 
ethnicity than race. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit on that? And how, how did that work in Lion King? That's important to me that when I see a company, I want to see everybody black, white, pink, green, and say dancing in a similar fashion. So I get the language of the company. They do this, they don't do this, you know, whatever the shapes are they want to do. That's important to me. And I've achieved that with my dancers. And my children that dance now, oh my God. I mean, Bill Ferguson teaches them. I don't do anything with them. But they're wonderful, and it's the only dance company still in Rochester where you see all genders. She's got lots of boys, and including his, his son, um, and um, all races, biracials, everything. And they love each other, and they compete with each other, and they applaud each other, and that's the way youth should be. So I'm very proud of that. How's the uh, company evolved over these, these years to, to get to this point? Hard, hard, hard work. And I thank again PJ and Natalie and Bill and Nikki, all my senior dancers and Steve, of course, in keeping that discipline in. That discipline is so important because I said my studio is a sacred space. The muses, the gods, they rely there. You know, my grandparents that loved the arts, they rely there. You know, so I don't want that disturbed with BS, you know. Um, biological sciences, I mean, you know. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, don't want, I don't want that messed up with BS, you know, because it really ruins the whole temperature. But that's important and rehearse it until you get it right. There's a transition now going on with lots of our young people. Because they don't play ball in the alley anymore, they don't jump rope for fun anymore. They're electronic babies. They got these wonderful machines that they can manipulate however they want. And with those machines, you can explode, change, rearrange anything with just a touch of a button. But dance is not like that. <clears throat> and the human body has flus, you know, certain days of the month, of all kinds of things that happen to the human body that you have to fight mentally and spiritually, compensate for it, and still do the best show you can do, you know. And it's a hard one for them, so it takes them longer to learn certain physical things than it used to, and we have to learn. However, they love looking at videos of how it used to be. But the transition that comes with how you're gonna get to that quality eludes them. And as an educator, I have to spend some more time on that. Do you think that dance, whether it's modern dance or ballet, gets the respect it deserves in the arts? No, it's the stepchild of the arts because it's the latest that came to the stage. You know, we had drama and singing and all of that years before we had dance coming to the stage. And ballet is a learned technique and ballet idioms all mean a lot of things and you have miming in, in, in ballet. And people feel that they don't know enough to really now, I'm a contemporary choreographer, and I, as you know, I've choreographed for New York City Ballet Dance City of Harlem, and still have a piece outstanding for Stuttgart. But um, it's important to communicate to people. You don't have to know what everything means. Look at it. Listen to the music. See how the movement and the music interact how they correspond with each other. Because the old fashioned days of everything being on the notes, yeah, you know, we don't do that. And way back from Mr. B stopped doing that, you know. How uh, are you going to be able to sustain this, this energy, this, you know, tremendous company that you founded uh, into the future? Have you thought about what this company ought to be in 10 years? Oh, yes, yeah. It's documented and, and, and legalized. I don't want it to become a repertory company. Um, I want it to have my, Merce closed down his company when he died. I don't want to do that. But I want the PJs and the Natalies and the Bills 
to have a place with organization and money so they can continue in the same style, but they'll bring new things to it. What Bill as a kid's doing already is new and wonderful. I don't want it to stay the same, but I want a tradition of fabulous contemporary movement, good ballet shapes and formats, and African Caribbean ease and fluidity, you know. It's, it's a good blend, I think, and the audiences and the critics around the world have said so. So it's not just me tooting my own horn. Garth, you've talked a lot about the uh, dancers who are important and have helped you over the years mm -hmm. and have made this company so, so tremendous. And you mentioned your mother and your father and their influence, but today, who are the most important people in your life? Today. My great-grandson, Zakai, because he's seven years old and he's born on my birthday, so I have to protect him. <laughs> and he's doing a great job. But, um, and Bill's son, he calls me 3G, Grand Godfather Garth. That's what 3G means. And um, those kids, amazing. And, um, he, his vocabulary, he throws these big words at 3G all the time, and, I, and he's got to tell me what it means. And I say, compared to, and I'm become my father. Oi. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you know, and, and I still quiz him. Come on, what do you mean by that? And he takes me around my home and shows me new things and relationships that he just discovered, you know. Um, so the youth, the youth is the future, and we have to nourish them, but we also have to discipline them, and that's the thing that we're losing out on, the discipline where they think everything is free and, you know, yeah, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a, the problem we need to have as, as seniors and parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. <laughs> well, that, that's wonderful. Um, Garth, I have a tradition of asking my guests the same three questions at the end of the show to, mm -hmm. to hear people's thoughts. And I'd like to do that uh, today right. and ask you if there's one thing you could change about Rochester, what would it be? Um, a little bit, a lot more involvement in the arts. They love their sports. And I love sports. This is World Cup and I'm going to pieces, okay? Foot, football, soccer is my favorite sport. I have trophies from it. But anyway, but understanding the art some more, <clears throat> knowing that because you saw one play at Jeeva, seeing it a second time, you learn more. And a third time, even more, you know? And, or a different style of play than you usually go to. And just because you saw my dances once, baby, you got 10 times to see me. Well, they found that out with Lion King. People have been taking mm -hmm. <coughs> kids and younger kids to Lion King. And I say, I missed that the first time. I say, yeah, there's a lot up there that you can miss. And listening to music, Brahms is one of my favorite um, classical composers. And depending on the mood I'm in, I hear my Brahms differently. But it always interests me and calms me down. Jazz is my favorite music, but I'm hard on jazz musicians. I hate four square jazz music, you know. Mm -hmm. You gotta really have a groove. And, um, but that's what I would love to say, to see. Well, what do you love most about Rochester? I love springtime in Rochester. I mean, coming from Jamaica where flowers bloom all year and whatever, after the winter, not as terrible as this winter was, but our normal winters, when the blossoms come out, oh my God, I have two Japanese cherries in my front yard, tall, 60 footers, and they just drizzle flowers, you know. And all, 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 all the things, and the tulips, and the daffodils, you know. My friend Debron and has a whole 
driveway covered in, in um, daffodils, you know. I love that about Rochester, the beautiful spring flowers. But what's Rochester's best kept secret? And I'm not going to let you say Garth Fagan because you're not a secret here. Right. Um, <clears throat> I guess there's some really great house parties that occur in Rochester. The nightlife out there in the clubs is not so much. It's not New York. It's not Chicago, you know. But I've been to some great parties in some homes in Rochester. Really mellow, good food, and not just chips and dip, but I <laughs> mean real cooked delicious food and lovely wines. I'm a wino, I like wine, so I don't do the other stuff. But um, I, I know quite a few of those. I can call on the phone and say I'm coming over. Okay, well, we'll be giving you a call and hoping for an invitation to one of those parties. Well, your wife can come anytime, but I'm not so sure about you. But <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you, Garth. Thanks thank you so lot, much. Norm. Thank it's you been a pleasure. So much. And thank you for watching. You can share this program or watch it online at wxxi.org. And we'll see you next time on Norm and Company.